Good evening, and welcome to the closing event for the first phase of Contagion. Contagion is Science Gallery Bengaluru's fourth exhibition where we have traced the transmission of ideas, emotions, and behaviors alongside the spread of disease. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a public institution established by the government of Karnataka to reduce the distance between research and the public at large. We are one of nine such university-linked galleries across the world in a network dedicated to bring together the human and natural sciences with art and engineering. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this event. And I'm aware that there are, there are, there's a, there are a number of dignitaries who are attending the event. I'm pleased that we are joined by Dr. Kiran Masundar Shaw, Executive Chair Biocon, and who chairs the Science Gallery Bengaluru Board of Directors, Professor Lothar Wieler, President of the Robert Koch Institute, Berlin, Professor Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, and Professor Chandrima Shah, President of the Indian National Science Academy. I'm especially delighted to welcome Sir Jeremy Farrar, Director of Welcome, who will deliver today's public lecture. But before I call upon Jeremy, I would like to invite Ms. Rohini Nilekani, Chairperson Argyam, and a valued member of Science Gallery Bengaluru's Board of Directors to open the evening. Rohini Nilekani, who's no, you know, who needs no introduction to Bangaloreans or to Indians, and of course, to much of the globe, is the founder chairperson of Argyam, a foundation he set up for sustainable water and sanitation, which funds initiative all across India. She's co-founder and director of Step a non-profit education platform. She sits on the board of trustees of the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment and serves on the, uh, serves on the eminent persons advisory group of the Competition Commission of India. Ms. Nilikani has written for many leading publications such as the Times of India, India Today and Mint. In 2017, she was inducted as foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also a member of the advisory board of the Wellbeing Project from 2019. Over to you, Rohini. Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much, Janavi, for that introduction. Um, welcome, especially uh, to Sir Jeremy Farrar and too many distinguished people to name. I really want to thank everyone who has joined us here today uh, to close this phase one of Science Gall Gallery Bengaluru's first fully online exhibition season that is Contagion. And what an amazing month and a half it has been. The team did a tremendous job with this very creative, very comprehensive exhibition. And on behalf of everyone who saw even one exhibit, I want to celebrate first everyone in the team for their hard work and their many design innovations. Almost a year of social distancing and isolation have obviously made us value our communities and our public spaces even more. And not only do public spaces build a sense of identity and shared ownership of the city in which they are and its environs, they also become a hub for public discourse, engagement, and dialogue. Science Gallery Bengaluru is hopefully shaping into exactly one such public space in Bangalore, alongside the Bangalore International Center, the Museum of Art and Photography, Ranga Shankara, and too many others to name. And through their exhibitions and programs, Science Gallery Bengaluru connects with the city and especially its youth, invites them to make it their own space by crafting a vibrant cultural conversation on science. Bangalore is already, as you all know, a leader in science research and technology in the country with institutions such as IISC, NAL, ISRO, DRDO, NCBS, to name only a few, and with such globally renowned scientists that it boasts of, such as Nobel laureate C.V. Raman, Satish Dhawan, Radha Narasimha, Obed Siddiqui, and many others who continue to work in our many institutions and laboratories. But the mission of the Science Gallery is really to take science beyond the hallowed gates and laboratories of these institutions, right out onto the streets, mingling with the citizens, instilling in them pride for the city, yes, but more importantly, curiosity, about scientific research and experimentation and the increasing importance such knowledge has in our lives. As Jahannavi already said, Science Gallery has a special focus on the young. As we have seen over the past one and a half years, the country's youth have played a critical role in challenging public health uh, crises 
that we have seen, this crisis that we have seen. And they have come forward to help in a very humanitarian and innovative way. And as a society, it is our responsibility to invest in them and empower them to become active citizens of the future as well. And working with partners such as Azim Premji Fields Institute, the Agastya International Foundation, Science Gallery has created online learning resources for over 100,000 young people and training programs for youth working in underserved communities on COVID awareness. Additionally, during this exhibition contagion, Science Gallery Bengaluru has trained its largest cohort of mediators to date. The mediators, young, enthusiastic people whom some of you may have met, have conversed with visitors from across the globe through this exhibition, and not just in English, but also in Kannada, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, Telugu, and other languages. <laughs> Contagion's masterclasses, workshops, and tutorials have now become a global platform for young people to be mentored by experts across disciplines. The pandemic has further exposed the gap between research and the public. There's an urgent need for strong efforts to facilitate better public understanding and appreciation of science. Young people need to get excited about curiosity driven science, about scientific exploration that could create and design a better, more hopeful future. This can only occur through a democratic dialogue on, on where research intersects with our lives. Contagion did exactly this and touches upon this through its exhibits like Ranjit Kandalgaonkar's Drawing the Bombay Plague, which was fascinating, and Christos Linteris's Controlling the Plague in British India. They provided a subtle yet sharp commentary on the dissonance between scientific research, the formulation of policy, and its subsequent implementation and therefore impact on society. The programs at Contagion further highlighted this dissonance and an expert panel of a virologist, a physician, epidemiologist, and rural and tribal public health practitioner, led by the immunologist Ajit Lalwani, unpacked this fraught relationship between scientific evidence and the ground realities of pandemic control measures, especially in India today. So contagion invites us to think differently, to th open our minds. It encourages us encouraged us in all these days and will continue to do so to ask critical questions of the world around us and it does so by offering to open doors of learning that any anybody from the public should feel comfortable walking through contagion the exhibition also wants us to reflect upon rapid scientific and technological progress to see that nobody is left behind an inclusive vision of the future we are witnessing the cracks caused by widespread structural inequities in vaccine development and distribution, which Achal Prabhala spoke about in his lecture. And we find a heart-rending experience because of skewed access to healthcare in Bas Stit De Stit Gen, sorry, excuse me, exhibit, which was called Fluid Dialogues. And also in T. Jayashree's film, A Human Question, Adia Benton spoke of the politics of care in a global health system that is becoming increasingly militarized. How do we make our way out of this? How do we begin to reimagine the health sciences to integrate human, animal, and planetary health? The frameworks of One Health are one way forward and were explored by Uma Ramakrishnan and Michael Bresalia's talks in the Contagion's public lecture series. Contagion, as several of our participants and visitors have said, is timely and relevant. It provides historical, conceptual, and ethnographic context for the pandemic and the pandemics to come. And this has, in some sense, shed a lot more light and allowed people to be equipped with some kind of knowledge to give themselves feel a little more empowered when they see that such experiences have happened to people before. We have been here before. We have within us the wherewithal to confront what is in front of us and to prevent what may come in the future. Science Gallery Bengaluru has chosen to explore transmission as a phenomenon rather than focus only on disease. And by looking at the spread of ideas, emotions, and behavior, the entire program provided us with some relief from the relentless and somewhat terrifying news around us. 
by helping us to put pieces together and make sense of it and take a longer and broader view. Uh, given the difficulty of assessing and filtering vast amounts of information in the public domain, which is now called the infodemic, Science Gallery Bengaluru also provided a platform for young people to ask questions and engage with leading experts like Gagandeep Kang and Shahid Jamil uh, during this one and a half months. And the good news is that I'm very pleased to announce that Contagion, the exhibition season, will remain live with monthly programming until the end of this year, until 31st December 2021. With the generous consent of the artists and scholars that are exhibiting, we're able to extend the duration of this exhibition season. And we thank the artists and scholars, given the crisis that we are continuing to live to, through. It is vital that Contagion remains freely accessible as a public resource. The team will continue to add new resources and new programs. So all of you who are listening, please check in, spread the word. And we are going to keep on trying to evolve and improve. We always welcome your feedback. And finally, I'm delighted to be able to launch the gallery's first annual review today. Contagion is um, the Science Gallery's fourth exhibition. Uh, let's look back at the first two years of our programming. Let's savor moments from the three exhibitions, Elements, Submerge, and Phytopia. And we are so proud to have an alumni of our mediator uh, uh, to joining us. We have built strong partnerships with institutions, both in India and abroad. So we ask you to share this, spread the news about Science Gallery Bengaluru. We are proud to belong to this group of science galleries from around the world. And we hope to keep working hard to bring citizens and science closer together. I very much look forward to Jeremy Farrar's lecture today. And please, everybody, spread the word. Keep coming to our exhibitions. Come to the physical place as soon as it is ready. Fingers crossed that it happens soon. Thank you for all your support. Namaste, good evening, stay safe, and back to you, Janvi. Thank you so much, Rohini, for your encouraging words and uh, your kind words. Uh, your encouragement means a lot to the team, and you're aware of that. It gives me now tremendous pleasure to introduce Sir Jeremy Farrar, Director of The Welcome, a politically and financially independent global charitable foundation that exists to fund science to solve the urgent health challenges facing everyone. Jeremy is a clinic, clinical scientist who, before joining Welcome, was the director of the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Vietnam for 18 years. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, United Kingdom, the National Academies, United States of America, the European Molecular Biology Organization, and a fellow of the Royal Society. Jeremy was knighted in the Queen's 2018 New Year Honours for Services to Global Health. Jeremy's lecture today is called Science, Innovation and Society, What Have We Learned from the COVID-19 Pandemic? Jeremy has agreed to take questions after the talk, so please do put in your questions in the Q&A box or do have your hands up and we will be able to take you on. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, uh, Jahanivi and, and Rohina. Thank you for those introductory comments in your speech. They they were inspirational to listen to and, and what the, um, the vision of the Science Gallery Bengaluru is, is about. Um, it was a fantastic introduction and it's an honor to be able to join you today and, and also to, to follow in the, in the footsteps of a remarkable group of people who have come and uh, shared their time, both the artists in the gallery and, and also the people who have come to give talks. I, I don't know everybody that's on this call, I'm sure, but but I certainly recognize some names and um, it's, it's great to, to be able to join you today. And before we go on to talk about um, very important and, and I'm afraid to say very troubling um, issues still uh, in the main part of the talk, just, just to start with a few comments at the start. The, the first is to share with you all some spring flowers from the UK or spring or early summer flowers from the UK um, to say thank you for the invitation to come and talk. The second on a more lighthearted moment is um, India and England face each other at cricket later in the summer. And I'm afraid um, I'm not, I'm looking forward to watching India, but I'm not looking forward to the result of that 
series. Uh, and then finally, in much more serious tone, um, all my thoughts uh, with in solidarity with the, the people of India, colleagues and friends across the country who are going through, I know, a very difficult phase, as indeed the UK did in January and February of this year, and again, actually now um, is looking troubling in the UK as well. So just want to extend my own uh, sense of solidarity and support for everything that you are doing and the difficult times you are going through. And to thank India uh, for being a fantastic partner through, yes, the Science Gallery Bangalore and the International Network of Science Galleries. And that's a major part of what Welcome is committed to doing, absolutely committed to public engagement in science and uh, opening minds and inspiring individuals, as Rohini, you said earlier. But also India has been a fantastic partner through the India Alliance, um, pay tribute to the leadership of, of many people involved there over many, many years, and some of whom I know are on the call, uh, but also founding partner in CEPI uh, in 2017, which has been so critical to the uh, development of vaccines over the last uh, uh, 18 months. And of course, India's remarkable contribution to the COVAX facility for sharing vaccines globally uh, and the ACT Accelerator through the World Health Organization. So thank you on behalf of everybody for everything that's going, that India has contributed to over the last years and particularly over the last uh, 12 months. So to start, I, I, I thought, um, and Javini and, and I talked yesterday, and to start with three questions, and I'll and then I'll try and address those three questions through the talk and make the three questions available, uh, of course, during the talk and, the, and then afterwards. And the three questions that I came up with to pose uh, and then at least try and start to answer um, are uh, three questions. The first one is, um, what, must, what must we do to bring this phase of the pandemic to an end? Uh, I think that is the most acute question we must all ask ourselves today. The second one is, how can we, how can we connect science and our cultures, our societies, and how can we connect those in a more accessible, a more equitable way in the future? What lessons do we have to learn? What hard challenges do we have to ask ourselves about, about why things have worked and importantly, why things have not worked? And then the third one, is if we assume, which I think is true, that COVID-19 is the first crisis of the 21st century at a global level, what lessons can we learn as we address another inevitable lessons in the 21st century, which will have similar themes? They will be transnational. Uh, they will require science to play a role. They will critically depend on society embracing that science and using it. And how can we do that at a time of rising populism and rising nationalism when all of the great challenges of the 21st century are by their nature going to be transnational? So those are my three questions. Uh, I don't have answers to all of them. They're challenging and difficult questions if we really ask them seriously and we move away from sound bites to actually using this horror of the COVID-19 pandemic to just reset what we're doing and to rethink how can we prevent these episodes? How can we be better prepared to respond to them? And how can we work better together across the world rather than in individual countries to address these major challenges of the 21st century? If we can do that, if we're willing to ask those hard questions, if we're willing to make the reforms that are undoubtedly needed in both our national and international structures, then I have more confidence that we can address the great challenges of the 21st century. But if we do not, if we seek to move on too quickly, if we seek to cover up and, uh, uh, and, and pretend that COVID-19 was not quite as bad as, as it has been, if we seek to move on too quickly and we don't use this time to question what worked and what did not, then I fear we will be inevitably uh, uh, make the same mistake in the other challenges that we will face in the coming weeks, months, and years ahead. And that would be a dereliction of duty, I think, to both current and future generations. So to go back to my first question, what must be done to bring the pandemic to an end? Well, firstly, I would start by, by saying, I think this is now an endemic infection in humans. 
Um, I do not think we are going to eliminate or eradicate SARS-CoV-2 virus. I think it is now a human endemic infection and we need to be able to use the best science to make sure that we transform what has been a horrific year into one where humanity can deal with what is now an endemic human infection, as we have been able to do with many other infections throughout history. But I think to see this as something that will come to an end and we will suddenly wake up one day in the future and SARS-CoV-2 virus will no longer exist in humans, I think that is fanciful. I think we've got to change our mindset to think that we are now in the acute phase, perhaps the most troubling phase of the pandemic, but that it will not come to an end, but we will need to learn to live with it. And what do we need to do to move from the current very acute phase that is so very troubling to a phase which is more manageable and which humanity can, can learn to live with where the endemic infection? I think the answers to this are actually very straightforward. The challenge is not the answers, the challenge is how to achieve them. Uh, the answers, I think, to bringing this phase of the pandemic to a close are to implement the measures that we do know work, the public health measures, uh, the testing, the infection control in our communities, in our families, in our homes, and in our hospitals, and in our care homes. Infection control, hand washing, yes, wearing of masks, avoiding those places that cause most transmission to occur. And that is mostly indoors, mostly actually within and with people we know in crowded settings where ventilation is not as good. And we know how to control this epidemic and countries around, some countries around the world have done a remarkable job in doing so. The difficulty is persuading all of us to follow those simple guidelines around infection control and avoiding the high risk transmission settings and to keep doing that, I'm afraid, until we can plan that exit strategy carefully. So public health, Public health remains absolutely at the core of bringing the current acute phase of this pandemic to a close, uh, along, of course, with testing and then a willingness to isolate ourselves if we prove to be positive. The second element is, is clinical care. And we have shown, as and many people have shown this around the world, that you can reduce the chance of dying from this infection uh, and you can reduce the chance of suffering from this infection with improved clinical care. But that clinical care, whether it is access to oxygen, steroids, other treatments, uh, uh, personal protective equipment for nurses and doctors, that clinical care is only good if it's available to everybody. This infection disproportionately affects people, of course, that are more senior and people with other illnesses, but in truth, it affects everybody. And if we are to have a more equitable world in the future, we have to ensure that clinical services are available to everybody, not just those that ha have the ability to pay for them. Access to clinical care is critical. Thirdly, we must support economies uh, and we must support by that jobs, people's livelihoods, both those employed, self-employed and those not working, people within the main structure of society and those outside that main structure of society. We must support the next generation through educational opportunities. This requires governments to act both nationally and internationally to ensure the economic impacts of this dreadful episode do not impact on people's ability to live their lives, provide for their children and their families, and economic support is absolutely critical. And fourthly, access to vaccines. Science has demonstrated the way out of this acute phase of the pandemic. The vaccines developed in under a year are nothing short of staggering. Remarkably safe in all ages, adults in, for sure, and children, I believe the data will be available soon. Incredibly safe and incredibly effective at preventing people getting sick, going to hospital and dying, and actually a stronger impact on transmission than perhaps I dare dream of a year ago. But those vaccines are only good if you get it to people and you get first dose and you get second dose. Uh, and if we, if we have the exit strategy, if science has given the vaccines that will allow us to move beyond this phase of the pandemic and we do not make those vaccines available equitably to everybody in the world who needs it, and essentially that is the world, uh, 
then I think our generation who have gone through this will regret what's done and it'll be very difficult to rebuild the world. So it is about the science, but science is only good if it's accessible to everybody. And the challenge of the moment, I'm afraid, is incredible vaccine inequity in the world. The G7 countries are meeting at the moment in the UK, the G20 countries will meet very soon. And in essence, it does depend on the G7 and G20 and the rest of the world's countries coming together, enhancing the manufacturing capacity and ensuring a commitment to sharing the vaccine globally in 2021. I do not believe that making a billion doses available by the end of 2022 is a sufficiently ambitious uh, aim. If we only vaccinate the world by the end of 2022, that is 18 months away. This is enlightened self-interest. If we take 18 months to make these vaccines available to the world, then new variants will appear in the world, which will come back to haunt all of our countries. We have already had four new variants that have changed the course of the pandemic over the last six to nine months. There will be more in the future, and they're more likely to occur if transmission remains high, if vaccines are not available to everybody and we allow those new variants to occur, which may, not now, but may in the future, escape our public health and our vaccine measures that can provide the end. So this is a scientific, it's a public health, it's also an economic and financial imperative, as well, of course, as a moral and ethical one. Vaccines are only good if you vaccinate people. And I would call on all leaders of the world to think again, about the commitments to sharing vaccines globally and ensure that we move faster than the commitments that have already been made. The second question, how can we connect science, culture, society in a more accessible, open, transparent, inclusive way than we've done in the past? And here I think we have to challenge ourselves. We've all followed the mantra that we've all, including myself, have used over the last few years that we must make science more accessible, and we must make science more available to everybody. And yet here, in the midst of uh, a global crisis, that commitment to science in society and its commitment to making sure uh, that science is available to everybody has been questioned. And so I think those of us involved in the scientific endeavor, whether it's in policy, in public health, it's in science galleries such as this one, I think we need to re-challenge ourselves and to think how can we ensure that that science is available. I think it comes, I think it comes, and the think there is a very important word. I think it comes through education. I think it comes from scientists uh, coming out of their ivory towers and engaging, yes, with the public, but involving the public, not just engaging, involving the public. I think it needs to be inclusive. I think scientists need to appreciate their role in the political debates, in policy making. Uh, not enough scientists, in my view, have been willing to go into politics and use their skills and the scientific methods that they come with to have an impact in the political debate. And I think we need to break down this barrier between the public, between the researchers and scientific communities, and indeed with the political class and the government around the world. And that means being open and transparent. It means being open to different ideas and not closing them down. It means being available and accessible and being willing to be criticized. Uh, when you are in that sphere of policy making and public accountability, it is critical that you appreciate that you will be criticized. I hope that criticism stays on a certain line and there's no doubt, and there's people on this call I know that have suffered enormously personally uh, where that line has been crossed. But I don't think it can push us away and take us back into ivory towers. I think it behoves us even more, actually, to come out and involve and engage and have be part of the debate. Because if we again, if we look at the great challenges of the 21st century, science is going to play a role in addressing all of them. And when I talk about science, I mean the physical sciences, the, the uh, social sciences, the biomedical sciences, all areas of science are going to play a role in addressing the great challenges of the 21st century. But we need to make sure that that science is part of our culture, it's part of our education, it's part of our politics and our policy making, and we cannot just expect it to come into those spheres when we want to say something. It has to be embedded and it has to be integral and it has to not just engage, but also, I believe, 
involve. And I think as, as all of us on this call and the Science Gallery of Bengaluru in particular, I think it behoves us all to re-challenge ourselves of what does that engagement really mean? Uh, what does that involvement really mean? And how can we learn the lessons of the last uh, two or three years, but particularly the last 18 months, and make sure that we also challenge ourselves to how that is, that is done. And the third area, which I think is, is perhaps even bigger than the first two, and that is if we look at the great challenges we are going to face in the 21st century, and we could argue what we all think they are, but some of them that I believe will come to challenge this generation and future generations are undoubtedly climate change, access to energy, access to water, clean water and, and water. Uh, it is about inequality. It is about haves and have nots. It's about inter and intra inequalities within and between countries. It is about medically, about drug resistance and about pandemics and the change of uh, biodiversity and land use. These are all challenges of the 21st century. Their impacts will be felt inequitably around the world. They will be felt at a local and national level, but the solutions where science will play a role are all transnational. And how at a moment in history, when geopolitics is increasingly tense, east, west, north, south, how when geopolitics is increasingly tense and fragmented, and nationalistic and often populist. How can we make sure that these global issues, which do require global solutions rather than nationalistic approaches, how can we rebuild that world when the challenges are by their nature global? The pandemic of 2019, 20 and 21 demonstrates how vulnerable and small the world is, how interconnected we are, how something happening here in Oxford today has a implication for Bangalore tomorrow, uh, for Berlin the next day, for Washington, for Beijing, and everywhere in between. And I don't have an answer to this one because I do worry that over the last certainly five to 10 years in different ways in different countries, the world is going down a somewhat frightening path uh, as power bases change around the world. And yet our challenges in the 21st century are by their nature transnational. So how we do this in the context of those challenges, I do not know, but I do think science and scientists and galleries and exhibits and public spaces are going to be absolutely crucial to those. Whilst politicians and policymakers may argue uh, between themselves and between nations, I think scientists and public engagement and public involvement and people who have appreciated and understood history and where we are in in, in society today. I think we have a great responsibility to ensure that we reach across nations, that we uh, address issues of inequality, and we address issues where politicians and policymakers may take us in different directions. That is not uh, to take the role of politicians and policymakers. They must hold the decisions in this. But I do think science has got a role because science is inherently global and science is inherently collaborative and working in partnership. Science can inspire, science can lift all of us and give us hope for the future. And there's no doubt that in the pandemics, the climate change, the loss of biodiversity, uh, and all of the other great challenges of the 21st century, science is going to play an absolutely critical role. But we as scientists have got to, I think, rethink the way we engage, the way we involve, and the way we go about what we do if we're going to make sure that that science reaches the maximum number of people globally and it's done in the most equitable and accessible way. And just to finish, I think we must also make sure uh, that we do not move on too quickly. There is also a, already, I think, a tendency in some parts of the world, uh, I feel it a little bit here in the UK, I think it's probably true in the United States, where we feel that the pandemic is almost coming to a close. And therefore we can move on and get back to business as usual. I think we are still closer to the start of this pandemic than the end. And I think we must not move on too quickly until we've really addressed the pandemic. We've really ensured there is equitable and accessible access to the tools of science that can end the pandemic phase that we are currently in. And then we pause and reflect and ask ourselves, what sort of world do we want for our children and for the 21st century? Because if we don't ask it now, I don't think we'll ever ask it. And now is the moment. 
So thank you for all you do at the Science Gallery of Bangalore. I hope to come and visit as soon as that is possible. I would wish you well in the coming cricket series versus England, but I think you won't probably need it. And thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for that wonderful um, call to action, um, for sharing your insights into public involvement in research as a step ahead of public engagement, which is something we will look into seriously at the gallery. And uh, more critically, given my own you know, training in politics and in history of science, that you ask us to look into politics, policy, and how they connect to research imperatives as we begin to find our way, as you say, very rightly so, what is only the start of this pandemic. So uh, as I said earlier, Jeremy has kindly agreed to take questions. So please either raise your hand or put your questions in the Q&A box and I will, um, uh, yeah, I will, I will either take the questions or we might just let you in. Uh, could we let in Shai Jamil into the room to ask the question, please? Yes. I can see the questions if that's any help. I do, how do you want me to do it? Yes, go ahead, Chai, please. Uh, hi, Jeremy, good, good to see you and good to hear you. Thank you for, for your talk. Uh, uh, I wanted your comment on this. Uh, you know, trust has been missing from many countries during the pandemic and trust comes from both transparency and the ability to speak the truth. Uh, unfortunately, in many countries, instead of evidence-based policy making, we have seen policy-based evidence making. I'd like to like you to spend maybe a minute commenting on this and why it is so important that people trust what science is telling them. People trust what policymakers are telling them. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Shahid. And, and uh, besides pay tribute to the work Shahid's done over so many years um, in, in many countries, but of course, mostly in India, but uh, um, you've been an inspiration to many people, Shahid. So thank you very much indeed. I, I think the question of trust is central to, in fact, to everything we've been talking about, frankly, and, and, and that's why I think for you to focus on it is absolutely uh, right. I do not believe you build trust in a crisis. It's extraordinarily difficult to build trust in a crisis. Uh, in fact, it's extraordinarily difficult to build anything in a crisis, but trust is certainly one of those. And I, I think it, it goes back to having uh, a continuous involvement and engagement across all stakeholders, society, uh, parts of society, culturally and um, in whatever way. Um, because I think that is built up, a bedrock of trust is built up over many, many, many years and is lost in an instant. Um, and I think that is with and between scientists, the community we are part of, and yes, includes politicians and policymakers. And I think on the latter issue, uh, I think it's critical, again, that we scientists do engage in that system. We build trust with policy and politicians who have a very difficult job. I'm not a politician or a policymaker, but, but I think they have an extraordinarily difficult job. And I think it's important that scientists are part of that process and there is a mutual understanding of, of what scientists can and what scientists cannot do. Um, I think scientists, we all need to have the humility to accept uncertainty and to explain that transparently and openly and not feel that we have to give simple answers when, when actually the situations are much more complex and be willing to say, I don't know, but I'm gonna find out. And, I'll, and I, as soon as I can, I will come back and explain my thinking behind. And, and in a crisis that has to be quite quick, but, but nevertheless. So I, I, I think trust is, is built up over years. Um, it, it can be lost in an instant and we must make sure that the transparency you talk about is absolutely uh, right. But also, Shade, I would just challenge, I'm afraid not all, some scientists, I think, have not necessarily always used the best evidence themselves. We had 
big issues at the start of the pandemic about what drugs worked and what didn't work, often uh, put forward on the basis of no evidence and no, um, no respect for the scientific methods. And I, I think the science community also, we need to look at ourselves and see how we have brought the evidence forward um, into the policy and public arena. Um, and so I, I think we also must look at our, ourselves um, as well. I hope that goes some way of answering a very, very deep question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shai, for the question. Um, we have a question from Kiran, who, uh, Kiran uh, Mazumdar Shah, who will be in the room in a second. Yes. Jeremy, thank you for a great talk. I think this is a great way of, you know, ending this first phase of uh, contagion. Uh, I think the question I want to ask is really about lockdowns. You know, can yeah. I think I uh, missed out, but. Basically, I just wanted to say that we are halfway through the pandemic and countries are really battling with uh, the severity of lockdowns. What is your uh, views on the extent of lockdowns that countries like India and others should basically look at? Well, firstly, I, I, I think lockdowns, I mean, lockdowns are awful. Um, nobody wants lockdowns. Um, and, and, and in a way, I think lockdowns are almost a, a sign of having failed to control the epidemic. Um, if you need to go to the draconian measures of locking down a society, um, in a way, I think it's an admission that we have failed to control the transmission in the early phases of the epidemic. The, 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 the best time to intervene in an epidemic is before it starts to prevent it. And if it starts to intervene early. And if you intervene early, don't go halfway. <laughs> because, because halfway houses get you the worst of all worlds. Um, they, they, they don't really reduce transmission and yet they put enormous burdens on people. Uh, I think you have to decide as a, as a region, as a country, as a whatever, um, are we going to do this? And earlier is always better and, and deeper than you think and more geographically. And then you can do things for a shorter period of time. It's when, and I speak here from the UK perspective at various points in 2020, it is when you delay those interventions that you then need to go further and deeper in order to have the same effect. Now, I, I absolutely understand why politicians and policymakers are very reluctant to go through those measures. They are very damaging to economies, to education, to mental health, and to many, many other aspects. The difficulty though, is if you go late and half-heartedly, you don't get the benefits and you have to act harder for longer. Um, and certainly in the UK, that, that was true to various points of 2020, lost control of the epidemic and then had to act even, even, even harder. So um, I do believe that that measures within the lockdown, uh, social distancing, infection control, stopping mixing, particularly indoors and poorly ventilated, they can reduce transmission. And many countries from Vietnam to Singapore, to Korea, to Japan, to Norway, have been able to control their epidemic. But everything is local in an epidemic. And the situation in India with the complexity that you face in India, with, with all countries have complexity, but the complexities in India, of course, make this much, much harder to adhere to and to implement. But, but I suppose my closing comment would be, act before you, need, you think you need to. Uh, don't think, do things half-heartedly. Make sure you support people through the lockdowns that probably are inevitable at some point. Uh, and lastly, lockdowns don't change the fundamentals. Uh, they buy you time to do the right things, which is testing, infection control, clinical care for everybody and basically vaccines because lockdowns don't change the fundamentals of the pandemic. They buy you time to do the right thing.
Thank you, Jeremy. That was Kiran, who's the chair of our, of our governing board. Um, the next question uh, is from Satyajit Mayer, um, the director of National Center for Biological Sciences. Jitu, would you like to ask your question, please? Sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jeremy, for that you know, really terrific and incredibly inspiring talk. Also, <clears throat> also, you know, on the occasion of the uh, of our exhibit, The Contagion, um, I, I had a more sort of direct uh, question, um, you know, coming from your expertise as an infectious disease um, uh, you know, a person who's looked at infectious disease for you know almost your entire lifetime. Uh, what, what do you see as the real causes, and and then of course the consequences of this devastating second wave that India went through? And um, I mean, I mean, how do you see this from from your perspective and from from a you know sort of a global perspective? And and what would you say you know about you know about the sort of the inevitable third wave or fourth or fifth wave that that will that will happen and how does one begin to deal with that and and what are the lessons that we could learn thank you very much i mean really diff <laughs> difficult aren't very difficult questions and difficult answers um there, there will continue to be waves of, uh, firstly, the infection is endemic in humanity now. It's not gonna disappear. I've said that earlier, I've been saying that for over a year and I think it's, it, it's undoubtedly true. Um, the, the virus is very new to humanity. It, evolved, it, it came across into humans at some point in 2019. Nobody really, none of us know when in 2019, but it, so it's a very, very new human infection. And through most of 2020, I think that it was essentially evolving um, to humanity. It was increasing its, its way it binds to the human cells. Uh, it was learning to transmit, not learning, but it was evolving to be more transmissible. And then in the latter half of 2020, it started to come across uh, humanity that had some degree of immunity from natural infection. And so in the latter half of 2020, in the first part of 2021, the virus was then under two very strong evolutionary pressures. And it's no surprise that, that it has evolved in uh, the end of 2020 and now in 2021. And the new variants uh, are all giving the virus an advantage. They transmit more, the, the Delta variant probably transmits 50 or 60% better than the original strain that emerged in 2019. Um, and therefore, we will continue to see waves of this pandemic until humanity has immunity. And population immunity uh, is critical to controlling every epidemic. Um, I believe you have to get there through vaccination. I think getting there through natural infection would come with an absolutely devastating uh, number of people dying. Uh, you would have to get to 80%, I think, of, of the population immune through natural infection. And with a mortality rate of about 1%, that's a staggering toll on any country. And so I do not believe that herd immunity or population immunity through natural infection is either possible, ethically acceptable, or a way to strategize how to come out of it. It can only be done, in my view, through vaccination. And that is why the current inequitable access to vaccines at a global level is just so damaging for individual countries and indeed for our ability as a world to control. The epidemic. So I think the devastating wave that India has been experiencing for the last weeks and months is as a result of a relatively low number of the people in the country having immunity. Uh, and secondly, because a new variant emerged, which was more transmissible and led to that third wave. The solution to this is simple to say, but very difficult to achieve. That is to make vaccines available to the world and make sure people have access to the vaccines and hopefully accept to take up the vaccines because that will build, if you like, a wall of immunity. And to be optimistic for a second, I think that actually immunity to this infection is better than we dared dream of a year ago. And the vaccines are both much safer and much more effective than we could have dreamed of in 2020. And therefore, I think our route out of this is through vaccination now and vaccination at a global level accessible in an equitable way to everybody. So I would just encourage everybody to be vaccinated if you haven't already, 
uh, and to make sure you get both doses of vaccine, because I think that is the exit strategy that will protect the world and it will protect all of us as individuals. And I think that is the only way actually to prevent future devastating waves of variants that come and escape from the immunity that we have from the vaccination. Thanks for that, Pimri. Thank you. Thank you. I will read you a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, you present the challenge as being a matter of better communication between scientists as a group and the public as an undifferentiated mass. Is there a place in your analysis for economic interests and their role in affecting public trust? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, absolutely there is. You know, um, science doesn't exist in a vacuum and it doesn't exist. There, there isn't a, a, an amorphous mass of the public. The, the amorphous mass of the public doesn't exist. Um, it's, it's, it's a, and the, one of the problems with, particularly I think with the biomedical scientific community is we tend, we tend to uh, be reductionist in our approach when actually, again, all of these great challenges that I talk about are about complex systems. Whether that is anthropological, it is language, it is, it is climate change or it's pandemics. These are not, um, these are not, you can't address these in a reductionist approach. You have to bring together whether it's across the range of science or an appreciation of how uh, individuals and their communities and the societies in which they're part of it. And that embrace it must embrace the social impacts, the economic consequences, the educational opportunities, the opportunities for livelihoods and jobs. And, and if you just take a medical perspective on this or even a broader public health perspective, I don't think we will address again any of these great challenges. And I, I think as we look forward, and we must challenge ourselves to rethink this, we have to take our reductionist expertise and put it in a respectful and learning and uh, with humility into that complex ecosystem that is actually where the solutions will be found. And that involves, not limited to, but that involves the arts, the humanities, uh, the economics, the politics, uh, religion, uh, beliefs, um, it involves the broad range. And I think that is what we're gonna have to think about in the 21st century in a way we didn't so much have to do that in the 20th century. Thank you. Um, John Matthew uh, has a question. Can we let him in please? Why don't I read you a, a question while we let in John? Uh, I think you answered this question, Jeremy, but I, uh, you know, when you spoke about humility um, and, uh, uh, you know, with which scientists and others should be working, but I think it might help to make that point probably once and very briefly again. People, the question from Vaibhavi is, people tend to select and believe in information that they like and benefit from and hence spread it around. Would the efforts of scientists and galleries like ours and other scientific communities be able to handle this? Yeah, and, and we're of course moving in a different era where information is shared in very many different ways, generationally, language-wise, uh, within countries, between countries. There are, there are so many avenues now um, because of the, everything that's going on around us that the information uh, is shared and nobody has a has a unique or, 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 or um, um, way of addressing all, all of those and, and encompassing them all is a, is a, is a great challenge. Um, but I think that, that the, the, the question you ask, which I'm, I'm just looking back up here again, sorry, um, better communication. I, 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 defining better is challenging. I think it's constant communication, constant commitment to transparency, um, constant willingness to, to, to try and explain and be challenged by your views. That, that doesn't mean to say you can't have confidential discussions. Of course, we all must have confidential discussions uh, to be able to air views. And, and, and sometimes that's best done, not in public, that's entirely appropriate. Um, but I think when, when, when one tries to get to either consensus or present uncertainty, then the willingness to accept that uncertainty and communicate that is, is critical. Um, so I, I, and this is what I was talking about in the second question I asked, is I think we've had a, a fairly, all of us, certainly myself, a uh, simplistic idea of engagement, public engagement. It's been the mantra of the last 10 or 20 years. I, I just think the last 12 months have really challenged that concept. 
Mm. And I don't think it goes far enough. I don't think we really understand what engagement means versus involvement. Um, and I think that's where we need to challenge ourselves because clearly that has broken down. The last thing I'd say on this is, is, is similar to the answer to, to, um, to Heed earlier, is that is I don't think you communicate in a crisis if you haven't communicated before. Mm. Um, you build communication and trust over time. And your point that people go back to the things they, they like or they believe in, they also go back to the things they've heard before and they've been communicated and, and they've been part of that communication and part of that involvement and engagement. And just thinking that you can turn that on when you want people to listen, I think is, mm. is arrogant and unlikely to work either. Um, John, would you like to go ahead and ask your question briefly? Sorry. Um, John, we, I've um, lost the question because I lost my connection. So could I trouble you to ask if you can see the question? I can. Yeah, I, can. I can. I mean, if, if you don't mind. Thank you, I... sir, Jeremy. That's very kind of you. <laughs> If I, don't, if I try and summarize your question, um, John is, is asking, um, uh, taking the point of inter and intranational uh, inequality, but following on the latter, uh, who speaks for people? It's a very, very important question. Does London, for instance, speak for the West or for the East or the West, North of, of England, let alone Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and also in the context of, of the centre, uh, the federal and the states of a country such as India and you know, Germany has a similar issue. United States has a, a similar issue. Australia has a similar issue. And I think there are lessons to be learned about actually the way each of those dealt with this complexity of the center, the federal and the state structure. I, I'm, I'll just give you my own view. I, I think everything in the end is local. I think in the end, epidemics are all about communities. Uh, and to try and run that from the center is extraordinarily difficult. But that does not mean to say the center doesn't have a role. And I would, I would look at um, a place I've been very impressed with, uh, two places, uh, Australia and Norway in this. They have both had, I think, the right sort of balance between a consistent national approach and a very much a local ownership approach. Now, it, it hasn't been free of trouble. There's been arguments, of, of course. But nevertheless, the fact that Australia was able to bring its, um, its federal structure together and its state structure and have a reasonably consistent approach across the states but allowing local leadership community leadership i think is a lesson for all of us in 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 how to do it norway very different not so much a federal and a state structure but nevertheless an incredibly st strong social contract that people in individual villages towns cities felt that the state was there for them not just in the crisis but for the years and decades before that of course a very rich country but nevertheless I think that incredibly strong social contract built up over many, many years meant that Norway was able to deal very strongly with the pandemic and, and actually has been one of the in, incredible success uh, stories. So I think I, I look at Norway and I look at Australia, but also I look at Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam has a very, very well-developed public health system that goes down to the commune level within the country. It has a very strong central government, obviously, uh, but nevertheless, things are driven locally by local communities, local ownership, and in the context of a federal state approach, which I think has also worked incredibly well, although Vietnam is going through a very troubling wave at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, right. Um, there is another question, and probably that we could make it the last question for the evening. How do you see the role of the World Health Organization, Gavi, CP, the UN, et cetera, in the years ahead? Will the same structures be fit for purpose in light of what we have learned now? Well, I, I'm, I'm a, I'll give you my own view at the start. I'm a, I'm a fan of the United Nations system and the World Health Organization. Um, but in, in the end, the World Health Organization is the, the strength of it, is that determined by the member states? If the member states want a strong WHO, they can have a strong WHO, but they then need to back it. They need to fund it properly, not, not argue over relatively small amounts of money. They need to back the leadership because I think the leadership of the WHO deserves it. Um, and the, it, it's a question for member states. Um, I think it deserves backing. And I think if we, again, if we look at the transnational challenges of the 21st century in health, 
climate impacts on health, pollution, drug resistance, pandemics. This needs a global response and it needs a global public health agency. And I think WHO deserve our respect. They deserve our support. And I think um, uh, attempts to undermine it over the last 12 months have been despicable and I think have been very negative to global health. So that doesn't mean to say that it doesn't need to reform. It, it doesn't need to focus on what it does really well and uniquely. Uh, and of course, it needs to be properly funded. But but the world would be much weaker and much poorer and I believe less healthy if it wasn't for the World Health Organization. The other agencies, technical, Gavi and CEPI, I think they will need to evolve, um, but we cannot, uh, we need industry. Industry has played a critical role in this pandemic and, and actually deserves great thanks for the development of tools that will enable us to escape industry and the non-pharma industry, logistics companies, et cetera, deserve, deserve our thanks. But we cannot only rely on a commercial driver for these things which are global public goods. You, there is no commercial driver for making vaccines against epidemics that may never happen. And yet we need them as a world. And that's where I think we need the public sector and philanthropy, the public sector to fund the development of these tools in an equitable and accessible way where there is no commercial driver. We will need to do that in partnership with industry, but we cannot just leave that to the market forces on their own because they won't give us what we need for these critical global public goods. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for your. I, I, yes, I mean, you know, if I if I if I look at the insights you've shared with us, the future is global. I mean, it has been for a while, but it's even more global when we consider the challenges ahead of us, and that communication is all the more important. I don't think we would find a stronger endorsement for the kind of role we are trying to play here um, in Bangalore and India, but also elsewhere. Thank you again, Jeremy. I will. Go ahead and offer a few closing remarks to this evening. Contagion began on 30th April, 2021, Contagion, the exhibition season, at an especially uncertain moment for all of us in India. We cannot imagine a more relevant moment to be holding this exhibition season, and yet we cannot imagine a more terrifying one given one, the digital divide, and two, that many simply do not have the bandwidth or the wherewithal or the luxury of engaging with us at this incredibly sad moment. We trust that this first phase has served as a space our visitors could rely on for credible expert opinion and for multiple opportunities that we tried to create to ask questions. This is only the beginning and we have a long way to go. We have pioneered a public laboratory complex to reimagine public spaces for science and art in the new century. However, until we open the doors to our labs in our new building, we are focusing on public engagement, probably start calling it public involvement. Today, more than ever, I will urge you to join us in our mission of bridging the distance between science and culture. We welcome scholars and artists to nurture with us future facing research practices and succeeding generations of active citizens. We welcome the public to conceive with us a future culture of research based claims in public life and policymaking. We welcome patrons, donors, and partnerships to support us in creating a space to envision a humane, reasonable, and resilient future. Together, we can build a world-class public institution for research-based engagement. I hope we have your support. May I call upon you all to support a public space for science, support India's future research pioneers, and support the spirit of experimentation. Contagion was made possible by the efforts of many. Okay, so Contagion was made possible by the efforts of many. The government of Karnataka has given us rock solid support to take this project further. We thank our three academic partners, the Indian Institute of Science, the National Center for Biological Sciences and Trishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology. A team of six put their heads together to realize Contagion. Daniel Olson from the Welcome Galleries, Madhushri Kamak, Program Manager at Science Gallery Bengaluru, and I would like to thank Mukun Tate, Sanjoy Bhattacharya, and Shahid Jamil for their time and valuable advice. Science Gallery Bengaluru will always work collaboratively with cultural and research institutions, and we were privileged this time to work with world-renowned institutions, the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, the John Innes Center in the United Kingdom, the Indian National Science Academy, the Welcome DBT India Alliance, and Dr. Jenner's House in the UK. 37 scholars and artists from across the world worked together to create 16 dynamic exhibits for Contagion, doing justice to the medium, 
making a truly virtual and digital exhibition as against trying to make a physical exhibition fit to purpose. 15 prominent scholars shared with us the top three questions on their mind, drawing on decades of research and experience in three minute long COVID. And I'm delighted to say today that we will add one more to it with Jeremy. Our public lecture series supported by the Indian National Science Academy, and I'm delighted that Professor Chandra Shah is with us this evening, saw 22 scholars delivering engaging lectures and tutorials in the last six weeks on a range of topics from global responses to COVID. And I'm very happy to see Professor Sheila Dasanoff in the audience as well on digital epidemiology, on dance, and on vaccines. Our Sketchnote Fellow Sneha Arvind has ensured that the lectures reach out to our young audiences as well. We screened five films at Contagion and hosted discussions between scholars and filmmakers. We held 18 workshops and masterclasses supported, supported by the DBT Welcome India Alliance, especially with the artist scholars for the young to learn more about creative processes behind the works that we exhibited and we organized eight events. We are committed to delivering our programs in English and Kannada to ensure that our programming reaches the interiors of the state of Karnataka. I'm happy to count on support from Shrikant Shastri and Chandan Gauda, especially when it comes to naming our exhibitions in Kannada, a language that I do not speak. They also helped us name the institution in Kannada. We are called Vidyana Vedike. Our mediators. Our mediators are the face of Science Gallery Bengaluru, an integral to public engagement. Selected through a rigorous process and trained by my team together with participating artists and scholars, they welcome and engage our audience. Without them, the exhibition, especially a virtual one, could be at times a desolate experience. We were lucky to have 35 enthusiastic mediators for Contagion. And finally, the team, my team, all of them but one on their first professional assignment. All of them young, all of them working from home. Some of, them some of them have never met each other in person. They bring audacity and a moral commitment to our collective endeavor. Moreover, they give me reason to believe that an institution such as ours is necessary, while also giving me the confidence that together we will realize our goals at the best possible standards. And we will bring you more. Stay tuned for the announcement of the next phase of Contagion. Until then, stay safe. And it's goodbye from all of us at Science Gallery Bengaluru. That's my team. Thank you. <laughs>